Chapter Eleven of Joe's Boys by Louisa May Alcott. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Joe's Boys by Louisa May Alcott. Chapter Eleven Emile's Thanksgiving. The Brenda was scudding along with all sail set to catch the rising wind and every one on board was rejoicing for the long voyage was drawing towards an end four weeks more mrs hardy and we'll give you a cup of tea such as you never had before said second mate hoffman as he paused between two ladies sitting in a sheltered corner of the deck i shall be glad to get it and still gladder to put my feet on solid ground answered the elder lady smiling for our friend emile was a favorite as well he might be since he devoted himself to the captain's wife and daughter who were the only passengers on board so shall i even if i have to wear a pair of shoes like chinese trunks i've tramped up and down the deck so much i shall be barefooted if we don't arrive soon laughed mary the daughter showing two shabby little boots as she glanced up at the companion of these tramps remembering gratefully how pleasant he had made them don't think there are any small enough in china answered emile with a sailor's ready gallantry privately resolving to hunt up the handsomest shoes he could find the moment he landed i don't know what you would have done for exercise dear if mr hoffman had not made you walk every day this lazy life is bad for young people though it suits an old body like me well enough in calm weather is this likely to be a gale think ye added mrs hardy with an anxious glance at the west where the sun was setting redly only a capful of wind ma'am just enough to send us along lively answered emile with a comprehensive glance aloft and alow please sing mr hoffman it's so pleasant to have music at this time we shall miss it very much when we get ashore said mary in a persuasive tone which would have won melody from a shark if such a thing were possible emile had often blessed his one accomplishment during these months for it cheered the long days and made the twilight hour his happiest time wind and weather permitting so now he gladly tuned his pipe and leaning on the taffrail near the girl watched the brown locks blowing in the wind as he sang her favorite song give me freshening breeze my boys a white and swelling sail a ship that cuts the dashing waves and weathers every gale what life is like a sailor's life so free so bold so brave his home the ocean's wide expanse a coral bed his grave just as the last notes of the clear strong voice died away mrs hardy suddenly exclaimed what's that emile's quick eye saw at once the little puff of smoke coming up a hatchway where no smoke should be and his heart seemed to stand still for an instant as the dread word fire flashed through his mind then he was quite steady and strolled away saying quietly smoking not allowed there i'll go and stop it but the instant he was out of sight his face changed and he leaped down the hatchway thinking with a queer smile on his lips if we are a fire i shouldn't wonder if i did make a coral bed my grave he was gone a few minutes and when he came up half stifled with smoke he was as white as a very brown man could be but calm and cool as he went to report to the captain fire in the hold sir don't frighten the women was captain hardy's first order then both bestirred themselves to discover how strong the treacherous enemy was and to rout it if possible the brenda's cargo was a very combustible one and in spite of the streams of water poured into the hold it was soon evident that the ship was doomed smoke began to ooze up between the planks everywhere and the rising gale soon fanned the smouldering fire to flames that began to break out here and there telling the dreadful truth too plainly for any one to hide mrs hardy and mary bore the shock bravely 
when told to be ready to quit the ship at a minute's notice the boats were hastily prepared and the men worked with a will to batten down every loophole whence the fire might escape soon the poor brenda was a floating furnace and the order to take to the boats came for all the women first of course and it was fortunate that being a merchantman there were no more passengers on board so there was no panic and one after the other the boats pushed off that in which the women were lingered near for the brave captain would be the last to leave his ship emile stayed by him till ordered away and reluctantly obeyed but it was well for him he went for just as he had regained the boat rocking far below half hidden by a cloud of smoke a mast undermined by the fire now raging in the bowels of the ship fell with a crash knocking captain hardy overboard the boat soon reached him as he floated out from the wreck and emile sprung into the sea to rescue him for he was wounded and senseless this accident made it necessary for the young man to take command and he at once ordered the men to pull for their lives as an explosion might occur at any moment the other boats were out of danger and all lingered to watch the splendid yet awesome spectacle of the burning ship alone on the wide sea reddening the night and casting a lurid glare upon the water where floated the frail boats filled with pale faces all turned for a last look at the fated brenda slowly settling to her watery grave no one saw the end however for the gale soon swept the watchers far away and separated them some never to meet again till the sea gives up its dead the boat whose fortunes we must follow was alone when dawn came up showing these survivors all the dangers of their situation food and water had been put in and such provision for comfort and safety as time allowed but it was evident that with a badly wounded man two women and seven sailors their supply would not last long and help was sorely needed their only hope was in meeting a ship although the gale which had raged all night had blown them out of their course to this hope all clung and whiled away the weary hours watching the horizon and cheering one another with prophecies of speedy rescue second mate hoffman was very brave and helpful though his unexpected responsibility weighed heavily on his shoulders for the captain's state seemed desperate the poor wife's grief wrung his heart and the blind confidence of the young girl in his power to save them made him feel that no sign of doubt or fear must lessen it the men did their part readily now but emile knew that if starvation and despair made brutes of them his task might be a terrible one so he clutched his courage with both hands kept up a manly front and spoke so cheerily of their good chances that all instinctively turned to him for guidance and support the first day and night passed in comparative comfort but when the third came things looked dark and hope began to fail the wounded man was delirious the wife worn out with anxiety and suspense the girl weak for want of food having put away half her biscuit for her mother and given her share of water to wet her father's feverish lips the sailors ceased rowing and sat grimly waiting openly reproaching their leader for not following their advice others demanding more food all waxing dangerous as privation and pain brought out the animal instincts lurking in them emile did his best but mortal man was helpless there and he could only turn his haggard face from the pitiless sky that dropped no rain for their thirst to the boundless sea where no sail appeared to gladden their longing eyes all day he tried to cheer and comfort them while hunger gnawed thirst parched and growing fear lay heavy at his heart he told stories to the men implored them to bear up for the helpless women's sake and promised rewards if they would pull while they had strength to regain the lost route as nearly as he could make it out and increase their chance of rescue 
he rigged an awning of sailcloth over the suffering man and tended him like a son comforted the wife and tried to make the pale girl forget herself by singing every song he knew or recounting his adventures by land and sea till she smiled and took heart for all ended well the fourth day came and the supply of food and water was nearly gone emile proposed to keep it for the sick man and the women but two of the men rebelled demanding their share emile gave up his as an example and several of the good fellows followed it with the quiet heroism which so often crops up in rough but manly natures this shamed the others and for another day an ominous peace reigned in that little world of suffering and suspense but during the night while emile worn out with fatigue left the watch to the most trustworthy sailor that he might snatch an hour's rest these two men got at the stores and stole the last of the bread and water and the one bottle of brandy which was carefully hoarded to keep up their strength and make the brackish water drinkable half mad with thirst they drank greedily and by morning one was in a stupor from which he never woke the other so crazed by the strong stimulant that when emile tried to control him he leaped overboard and was lost horror-stricken by this terrible scene the other men were submissive henceforth and the boat floated on and on with its sad freight of suffering souls and bodies another trial came to them that left all more despairing than before a sail appeared and for a time a frenzy of joy prevailed to be turned to bitterest disappointment when it passed by too far away to see the signals waved to them or hear the frantic cries for help that rang across the sea emile's heart sank then for the captain seemed dying and the women could not hold out much longer he kept up till night came then in the darkness broken only by the feeble murmuring of the sick man the whispered prayers of the poor wife the ceaseless swash of waves emile hid his face and had an hour of silent agony that aged him more than years of happy life could have done it was not the physical hardship that daunted him the want and weakness tortured him it was his dreadful powerlessness to conquer the cruel fate that seemed hanging over them the men he cared little for since these perils were but a part of the life they chose but the master he loved the good woman who had been so kind to him the sweet girl whose winsome presence had made the long voyage so pleasant for them all if he could only save these dear and innocent creatures from a cruel death he felt that he could willingly give his life for them as he sat there with his head in his hands bowed down by the first great trial of his young life the starless sky overhead the restless sea beneath and all around him suffering for which he had no help a soft sound broke the silence and he listened like one in a dream it was mary singing to her mother who lay sobbing in her arms spent with this long anguish a very faint and broken voice it was for the poor girl's lips were parched with thirst but the loving heart turned instinctively to the great helper in this hour of despair and he heard her feeble cry it was a sweet old hymn often sung at plumfield and as he listened all the happy past came back so clearly that emile forgot the bitter present and was at home again his talk on the housetop with aunt jo seemed but yesterday and with a pang of self-reproach he thought the scarlet strand i must remember it and do my duty to the end steer straight old boy and if you can't come into port go down with all sails set then as the soft voice crooned on to lull the weary woman to a fitful sleep emile for a little while forgot his burden in a dream of plumfield he saw them all heard the familiar voices felt the grip of welcoming hands and seemed to say to himself well they shall not be ashamed of me if i never see them any more a sudden shout startled him from that brief rest and a drop on his forehead told him that the blessed rain had come at last bringing salvation with it 
for thirst is harder to bear than hunger heat or cold welcomed by cries of joy all lifted up their parched lips held out their hands and spread their garments to catch the great drops that soon came pouring down to cool the sick man's fever quench the agony of thirst and bring refreshment to every weary body in the boat all night it fell all night the castaways revelled in the saving shower and took heart again like dying plants revived by heaven's dew the clouds broke away at dawn and emile sprung up wonderfully braced and cheered by those hours of silent gratitude for this answer to their cry for help but this was not all as his eye swept the horizon clear against the rosy sky shone the white sails of a ship so near that they could see the pennon at her masthead and black figures moving on the deck one cry broke from all those eager throats and rang across the sea as every man waved hat or handkerchief and the women stretched imploring hands towards this great white angel of deliverance coming down upon them as if the fresh wind filled every sail to help her on no disappointment now answering signals assured them of help and in the rapture of that moment the happy women fell on emile's neck giving him his reward in tears and blessings as their grateful hearts overflowed he always said that was the proudest moment of his life as he stood there holding mary in his arms for the brave girl who had kept up so long broke down then and clung to him half fainting while her mother busied herself about the invalid who seemed to feel the joyful stir and gave an order as if again on the deck of his lost ship it was soon over and then all were safely aboard the good urania homeward bound emile saw his friends in tender hands his men among their mates and told the story of the wreck before he thought of himself the savory odor of the soup carried by to the cabin for the ladies reminded him that he was starving and a sudden stagger betrayed his weakness he was instantly borne away to be half killed by kindness and being fed clothed and comforted was left to rest just as the surgeon left the stateroom he asked in his broken voice what day is this my head is so confused i've lost my reckoning thanksgiving day man and we'll give you a regular new england dinner if you'll eat it answered the surgeon heartily but emile was too spent to do anything except lie still and give thanks more fervently and gratefully than ever before for the blessed gift of life which was the sweeter for a sense of duty faithfully performed End of chapter 11chapter 12 of joe's boys by louisa may alcott this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org joe's boys by louisa may alcott chapter 12 dan's christmas where was dan in prison alas for mrs joe how her heart would have ached if she had known that while old plum shone with christmas cheer her boy sat alone in his cell trying to read the little book she gave him with eyes dimmed now and then by the hot tears no physical suffering had ever wrung from him and longing with a homesick heart for all that he had lost yes dan was in prison but no cry for help from him as he faced the terrible strait he was in with the dumb despair of an indian at the stake for his own bosom sin had brought him there and this was to be the bitter lesson that tamed the lawless spirit and taught him self-control the story of his downfall is soon told for it came as so often happens just when he felt unusually full of high hopes good resolutions and dreams of a better life on his journey he met a pleasant young fellow and naturally felt an interest in him as blair was on his way to join his elder brothers on a ranch in kansas card-playing was going on in the smoking-car 
and the lad for he was barely twenty tired with the long journey beguiled the way with such partners as appeared being full of spirits and a little intoxicated with the freedom of the west dan true to his promise would not join but watched with intense interest the games that went on and soon made up his mind that two of the men were sharpers anxious to fleece the boy who had imprudently displayed a well-filled pocket-book dan always had a soft spot in his heart for any younger weaker creature whom he met and something about the lad reminded him of teddy so he kept an eye on blair and warned him against his new friends vainly of course for when all stopped overnight in one of the great cities dan missed the boy from the hotel whither he had taken him for safe keeping and learning who had come for him went to find him calling himself a fool for his pains yet unable to leave the confiding boy to the dangers that surrounded him he found him gambling in a low place with the men who were bound to have his money and by the look of relief on blair's anxious face when he saw him dan knew without words that things were going badly with him and he saw the peril too late i can't come yet i've lost it's not my money i must get it back or i dare not face my brothers whispered the poor lad when dan begged him to get away without further loss shame and fear made him desperate and he played on sure that he could recover the money confided to his care seeing dan's resolute face keen eye and travelled air the sharpers were wary played fair and let the boy win a little but they had no mind to give up their prey and finding that dan stood sentinel at the boy's back an ominous glance was exchanged between them which meant we must get this fellow out of the way dan saw it and was on his guard for he and blair were strangers evil deeds are easily done in such places and no tales told but he would not desert the boy and still kept watch of every card till he plainly detected false play and boldly said so high words passed dan's indignation overcame his prudence and when the cheat refused to restore his plunder with insulting words and drawn pistol dan's hot temper flashed out and he knocked the man down with a blow that sent him crashing head first against a stove to roll senseless and bleeding to the floor a wild scene followed but in the midst of it dan whispered to the boy get away and hold your tongue don't mind me frightened and bewildered blair quitted the city at once leaving dan to pass the night in the lock-up and a few days later to stand in court charged with manslaughter for the man was dead dan had no friends and having once briefly told the story held his peace anxious to keep all knowledge of this sad affair from those at home he even concealed his name giving that of david kent as he had done several times before in emergencies it was all over very soon but as there were extenuating circumstances his sentence was a year in prison with hard labor dazed by the rapidity with which this horrible change in his life came upon him dan did not fully realize it till the iron door clanged behind him and he sat alone in a cell as narrow cold and silent as a tomb he knew that a word would bring mr lorry to help and comfort him but he could not bear to tell of this disgrace or see the sorrow and the shame it would cause the friends who hoped so much for him no he said clenching his fist i'll let them think me dead first i shall be if i'm kept here long and he sprang up to pace the stone floor like a caged lion with a turmoil of wrath and grief rebellion and remorse seething in heart and brain till he felt as if he should go mad and beat upon the walls that shut him away from the liberty which was his life for days he suffered terribly then worn out sank into a black melancholy sadder to see than his excitement the warden of this prison was a rough man who had won the ill-will of all by unnecessary harshness but the chaplain was full of sympathy 
and did his hard duty faithfully and tenderly. He labored with poor Dan, but seemed to make no impression, and was forced to wait till work had soothed the excited nerves and captivity tamed the proud spirit that would suffer but not complain. Dan was put in the brush shop, and feeling that activity was his only salvation, worked with a feverish energy that soon won the approval of the master and the envy of less skillful mates. Day after day he sat in his place, watched by an armed overseer, forbidden any but necessary words, no intercourse with the men beside him, no change but from cell to shop no exercise but the dreary marches to and fro each man's hand on the other's shoulder keeping step with the dreary tramp so different from the ringing tread of soldiers silent gaunt and grim dan did his daily task ate his bitter bread and obeyed commands with a rebellious flash of the eye that made the warden say that's a dangerous man watch him he'll break out some day there were others more dangerous than he, because older in crime and ready for any desperate outbreak to change the monotony of long sentences. These men soon divined Dan's mood, and in the mysterious way convicts invent, managed to convey to him, before a month was over, that plans were being made for a mutiny at the first opportunity. Thanksgiving Day was one of the few chances for them to speak together, as they enjoyed an hour of freedom in the prison yard. Then all would be settled, and the rash attempt made, if possible, probably to end in bloodshed and defeat for most, but liberty for a few. Dan had already planned his own escape, and bided his time, growing more and more moody, fierce, and rebellious, as loss of liberty wore upon soul and body for this sudden change from his free, healthy life to such a narrow, gloomy, and miserable one could not but have a terrible effect upon one of Dan's temperament and age. He brooded over his ruined life, gave up all his happy hopes and plans, felt that he could never face dear old Plumfield again or touch those friendly hands with the stain of blood upon his own, he did not care for the wretched man whom he had killed, for such a life was better ended, he thought. But the disgrace of prison would never be wiped out of his memory, though the cropped hair would grow again, the gray suit easily be replaced, and the bolts and bars left far behind. It's all over with me. I've spoilt my life. Now let it go. I'll give up the fight and get what pleasure I can anywhere, anyhow. They shall think me dead, so still care for me, but never know what I am. Poor Mother Bear. She tried to help me, but it's no use. The firebrand can't be saved. And dropping his head in his hands as he sat on his low bed, Dan would mourn over all he had lost in tearless misery, till merciful sleep would comfort him with dreams of the happy days when the boys played together or those still later and happier ones when all smiled on him, and Plumfield seemed to have gained a new and curious charm. There was one poor fellow in Dan's shop whose fate was harder than his, for his sentence expired in the spring, but there was little hope of his living till that time, and the coldest-hearted man pitied poor Mason as he sat coughing his life away in that close place, and counting the weary days yet to pass before he could see his wife and little child again. There was some hope that he might be pardoned out, but he had no friends to bestir themselves in the matter, and it was evident that the great judge's pardon would soon end his patient pain for ever. Dan pitied him more than he dared to show, and this one tender emotion in that dark time was like the little flower that sprung up between the stones of the prison yard and saved the captive from despair in the beautiful old story dan helped mason with his work when he was too feeble to finish his task and the grateful look that thanked him was a ray of sunshine to cheer his cell when he was alone mason envied the splendid health of his neighbor and mourned to see it wasting there 
he was a peaceful soul and tried as far as a whispered word or warning glance could do it to deter dan from joining the bad lot as the rebels were called but having turned his face from the light dan found the downward way easy and took a grim satisfaction in the prospect of a general outbreak during which he might revenge himself upon the tyrannical warden and strike a blow for his own liberty feeling that an hour of insurrection would be a welcome vent for the pent-up passions that tormented him he had tamed many a wild animal but his own lawless spirit was too much for him till he found the curb that made him master of himself the sunday before thanksgiving as he sat in chapel dan observed several guests in the seats reserved for them and looked anxiously to see if any familiar face was there for he had a mortal fear that some one from home would suddenly confront him no all were strangers and he soon forgot them in listening to the chaplain's cheerful words and the sad singing of many heavy hearts people often spoke to the convicts so it caused no surprise when on being invited to address them one of the ladies rose and said she would tell them a little story which announcement caused the younger listeners to pack up their ears and even the older ones to look interested for any change in their monotonous life was welcome the speaker was a middle-aged woman in black with a sympathetic face eyes full of compassion and a voice that seemed to warm the heart because of certain motherly tones in it she reminded dan of mrs joe and he listened intently to every word feeling that each was meant for him because by chance they came at the moment when he needed a softening memory to break up the ice of despair which was blighting all the good impulses of his nature it was a very simple little story but it caught the men's attention at once being about two soldiers in a hospital during the late war both badly wounded in the right arm and both anxious to save these breadwinners and go home unmaimed one was patient docile and cheerfully obeyed orders even when told that the arm must go he submitted and after much suffering recovered grateful for life though he could fight no more the other rebelled would listen to no advice and having delayed too long died a lingering death bitterly regretting his folly when it was too late now as all story should have a little moral let me tell you mine added the lady with a smile as she looked at the row of young men before her sadly wondering what brought them there this is a hospital for soldiers wounded in life's battle here are sick souls weak wills insane passions blind consciences all the ills that come from broken laws bringing their inevitable pain and punishment with them there is hope and help for every one for god's mercy is infinite and man's charity is great but penitence and submission must come before the cure is possible pay the forfeit manfully for it is just but from the suffering and shame ring new strength for a nobler life the scar will remain but it is better for a man to lose both arms than his soul in these hard years instead of being lost may be made the most precious of your lives if they teach you to rule yourselves o oh, friends try to outlive the bitter past to wash the sin away and begin anew if not for your own sakes for that of the dear mothers wives and children who wait and hope so patiently for you remember them and do not let them love and long in vain and if there be any here so forlorn that they have no friend to care for them never forget the father whose arms are always open to receive forgive and comfort his prodigal sons even at the eleventh hour then the little sermon ended but the preacher of it felt that her few hearty words had not been uttered in vain for one boy's head was down and several faces wore the softened look which told that a tender memory was touched dan was forced to set his lips to keep them steady and drop his eyes to hide the sudden dew that dimmed them when waiting hoping friends were spoken of he was glad to be alone in his cell again and sat thinking deeply instead of trying to forget himself in sleep 
it seemed as if those words were just what he needed to show him where he stood and how fateful the next few days might be to him should he join the bad lot and perhaps add another crime to the one already committed lengthen the sentence already so terrible to bear deliberately turn his back on all that was good and mar the future that might yet be redeemed or should he like the wiser man in the story submit bear the just punishment try to be better for it and though the scar would remain it might serve as a reminder of a battle not wholly lost since he had saved his soul though innocence was gone then he would dare go home perhaps confess and find fresh strength in the pity and consolation of those who never gave him up good and evil fought for dan that night as did the angel and the devil for sintram and it was hard to tell whether lawless nature or loving heart would conquer remorse and resentment shame and sorrow pride and passion made a battlefield of that narrow cell and the poor fellow felt as if he had fiercer enemies to fight now than any he had met in all his wanderings a little thing turned the scale as it so often does in these mysterious hearts of ours and a touch of sympathy helped dan decide the course which would bless or ban his life in the dark hour before the dawn as he lay wakeful on his bed a ray of light shone through the bars the bolts turned softly and a man came in it was the good chaplain led by the same instinct that brings a mother to her sick child's pillow for long experience as nurse of souls had taught him to see the signs of hope in the hard faces about him and to know when the moment came for a helpful word and the cordial of sincere prayer that brings such comfort and healing to tried and troubled hearts he had been to dan before at unexpected hours but always found him sullen indifferent or rebellious and had gone away to patiently bide his time now it had come a look of relief was in the prisoner's face as the light shone on it and the sound of a human voice was strangely comfortable after listening to the whispers of the passions doubts and fears which had haunted the cell for hours dismaying dan by their power and showing him how much he needed help to fight the good fight since he had no armor of his own kent poor mason is gone he left a message for you and i felt impelled to come and give it now because i think you were touched by what we heard to-day and in need of the help mason tried to give you said the chaplain taking the one seat and fixing his kind eyes on the grim figure in the bed thank you sir i'd like to hear it was all dan's answer but he forgot himself in pity for the poor fellow dead in prison with no last look at wife or child he went suddenly but remembered you and begged me to say these words tell him not to do it but to hold on do his best and when his time is out go right to mary and she'll make him welcome for my sake he's got no friends in these parts and will feel lonesome but a woman's always safe and comfortable when a fellow's down in his luck give him my love and good-bye for he was kind to me and god will bless him for it then he died quietly and to-morrow will go home with god's pardon since man's came too late dan said nothing but laid his arm across his face and lay quite still seeing that the pathetic little message had done its work even better than he hoped the chaplain went on unconscious how soothing his paternal voice was to the poor prisoner who longed to go home but felt he had forfeited the right i hope you won't disappoint this humble friend whose last thought was for you i know that there is trouble brewing and fear that you may be tempted to lend a hand on the wrong side don't do it for the plot will not succeed it never does and it would be a pity to spoil your record which is fair so far keep up your courage my son and go out the year's end better not worse for this hard experience remember a grateful woman waits to welcome and thank you if you have no friends of your own if you have do your best for their sake and let us ask god to help you as he only can then waiting for no answer the good man prayed heartily 
and dan listened as he never had before for the lonely hour the dying message the sudden uprising of his better self made it seem as if some kind angel had come to save and comfort him after that night there was a change in dan though no one knew it but the chaplain for to all the rest he was the same silent stern unsocial fellow as before and turning his back on the bad and the good alike found his only pleasure in the books his friend brought him slowly as the steadfast drop wears away the rock the patient kindness of this man won dan's confidence and led by him he began to climb out of the valley of humiliation towards the mountains whence through the clouds one can catch glimpses of the celestial city whither all true pilgrims sooner or later turn their wistful eyes and stumbling feet there were many backslidings many struggles with giant despair and fiery apollyon many heavy hours when life did not seem worth living and masons escaped the only hope but through all the grasp of a friendly hand the sound of a brother's voice the unquenchable desire to atone for the past by a better future and win the right to see home again kept poor dan to his great task as the old year drew to its end and the new waited to turn another leaf in the book whose hardest lesson he was learning now at christmas he yearned so for plumfield that he devised a way to send a word of greeting to cheer their anxious hearts and comfort his own he wrote to mary mason who lived in another state asking her to mail the letter he enclosed in it he merely said he was well and busy had given up the farm and had other plans which he would tell later would not be home before autumn probably nor write often but was all right and sent love and merry christmas to every one then he took up his solitary life again and tried to pay his forfeit manfully End of chapter 12「Thirteen of Joe's Boys by Louisa May Alcott. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Joe's Boys by Louisa May Alcott. Chapter Thirteen Nat's New Year. I don't expect to hear from Emil yet, and Nat writes regularly but where is dan only two or three postals since he went such an energetic fellow as he is could buy up all the farms in kansas by this time said mrs joe one morning when the mail came in and no card or envelope bore dan's dashing hand he never writes often you know but does his work and then comes home months and years seem to mean little to him and he is probably prospecting in the wilderness forgetful of time answered mr bear deep in one of nat's long letters from leipzig but he promised he would let me know how he got on and dan keeps his word if he can i'm afraid something has happened to him and mrs joe comforted herself by patting don's head as he came at the sound of his master's name to look at her with eyes almost human in their wistful intelligence don't worry mom dear nothing ever happens to the old fellow he'll turn up all right and come stalking him some day with a gold mine in one pocket and a prairie in the other as jolly as a grig said ted who was in no haste to deliver octu to her rightful owner perhaps he has gone to montana and given up the farm plan he seemed to like the indians best i thought and rob went to help his mother with her pile of letters and his cheerful suggestions i hope so it would suit him best but i am sure he would have told us his change of plan and sent for some money to work with no i feel in my prophetic bones that something is wrong said mrs joe looking as solemn as fate in a breakfast cap then we shall hear ill news always travels fast don't borrow trouble joe but hear how well nat is getting on i'd no idea the boy would care for anything but music my good friend baumgarten has launched him well 
and it will do him good if he lose not his head. A good lad, but new to the world, and Leipzig is full of snares for the unwary. God be with him. The professor read Nat's enthusiastic account of certain literary and musical parties he had been to, the splendors of the opera, the kindness of his new friends, the delight of studying under such a master as Bergman, his hopes of rapid gain, and his great gratitude to those who had opened this enchanted world to him. That, now, is satisfactory and comfortable. I felt that Nat had unsuspected power in him before he went away. He was so manly and full of excellent plans. Said Mrs. Joe in a satisfied tone, we shall see. He will doubtless get his lesson, and be the better for it. That comes to us all in our young days. I hope it will not be too hard for our good youngling, answered the professor with a wise smile, remembering his own student life in Germany. He was right, and Nat was already getting his lesson in life with a rapidity which would have astonished his friends at home. The manliness over which Mrs. Joe rejoiced was developing in unexpected ways, and quiet Nat had plunged into the more harmless dissipations of the gay city, with all the ardor of an inexperienced youth taking his first sip of pleasure. The entire freedom and sense of independence was delicious, for many benefits began to burden him, and he longed to stand on his own legs and make his own way no one knew his past here and with a well-stocked wardrobe a handsome sum at his bankers and the best teacher in leipzig he made his debut as a musical young gentleman presented by the much respected professor bear and the wealthy mr lawrence who had many friends glad to throw open their houses to his protege Thanks to these introductions, his fluent German, modest manners, and undeniable talent, the stranger was cordially welcomed and launched at once into a circle which many an ambitious young man strove in vain to enter. All this rather turned Nat's head, and as he sat in the brilliant opera house, chatted among the ladies at some select coffee party, or whisked an eminent professor's amiable daughter down the room trying to imagine she was daisy he often asked himself if this gay fellow could be the poor homeless little street musician who once stood waiting in the rain at the gates of plumfield his heart was true his impulses good and his ambitions high but the weak side of his nature came uppermost here vanity led him astray pleasure intoxicated him and for a time he forgot everything but the delights of this new and charming life without meaning to deceive he allowed people to imagine him a youth of good family and prospects he boasted a little of mr lorry's wealth and influence of professor bear's eminence and the flourishing college at which he himself had been educated mrs joe was introduced to the sentimental frauleins who read her books and the charms and virtues of his own dear mädchen confided to sympathetic mammas all these boyish boastings and innocent vanities were duly circulated among the gossips and his importance much increased thereby to his surprise and gratification as well as some shame but they bore fruit that was bitter in the end for finding that he was considered one of the upper class it very soon became impossible for him to live in the humble quarters he had chosen or to lead the studious quiet life planned for him he met other students young officers and gay fellows of all sorts and was flattered at being welcomed among them though it was a costly pleasure and often left a thorn of regret to vex his honest conscience he was tempted to take better rooms in a more fashionable street leaving good frau tetzel to lament his loss and his artist neighbor fraulein vogelstein to shake her gray ringlets and predict his return a sadder and wiser man 
the sum placed at his disposal for expenses and such simple pleasures as his busy life could command seemed a fortune to nat though it was smaller than generous mr lorry first proposed professor bear wisely counselled prudence as nat was unused to the care of money and the good man knew the temptations that a well-filled purse makes possible at this pleasure-loving age so nat enjoyed his handsome little apartment immensely and insensibly let many unaccustomed luxuries creep in he loved his music and never missed a lesson but the hours he should have spent in patient practice were too often wasted at theatre ball beer garden or club doing no harm beyond that waste of precious time and money not his own for he had no vices and took his recreation like a gentleman so far but slowly a change for the worse was beginning to show itself and he felt it these first steps along the flowery road were downward not upward and the constant sense of disloyalty which soon began to haunt him made nat feel in the few quiet hours he gave himself that all was not well with him in spite of the happy whirl in which he lived another month and then i will be steady he said more than once trying to excuse the delay by the fact that all was new to him that his friends at home wished him to be happy and that society was giving him the polish he needed but as each month slipped away it grew harder to escape he was inevitably drawn on and it was so easy to drift with the tide that he deferred the evil day as long as possible winter festivities followed the more wholesome summer pleasures and nat found them more costly for the hospitable ladies expected some return from the stranger and carriages bouquets theatre tickets and all the little expenses a young man cannot escape at such times told heavily on the purse which seemed bottomless at first taking mr lorry for his model nat became quite a gallant and was universally liked for through all the newly acquired airs and graces the genuine honesty and simplicity of his character plainly shone winning confidence and affection from all who knew him among these was a certain amiable old lady with a musical daughter well-born but poor and very anxious to marry the aforesaid daughter to some wealthy man nat's little fictions concerning his prospects and friends charmed the gnaji frau as much as his music and devoted manners did the sentimental mina their quiet parlor seemed homelike and restful to nat when tired of gayer scenes and the motherly interest of the elder lady was sweet and comfortable to him while the tender blue eyes of the pretty girl were always so full of welcome when he came of regret when he left and of admiration when he played to her that he found it impossible to keep away from this attractive spot he meant no harm and feared no danger having confided to the frau mamma that he was betrothed so he continued to call little dreaming what ambitious hopes the old lady cherished nor the peril there was in receiving the adoration of a romantic german girl till it was too late to spare her pain and himself great regret of course some inkling of these new and agreeable experiences got into the voluminous letters he never was too gay too busy or too tired to write each week and while daisy rejoiced over his happiness and success and the boys laughed at the idea of old chirper coming out as a society man the elders looked sober and said among themselves he is going too fast he must have a word of warning or trouble may come but mr lorry said oh let him have his fling he's been dependent and repressed long enough he can't go far with the money he has and i've no fear of his getting into debt he's too timid and too honest to be reckless it is his first taste of freedom let him enjoy it and he'll work the better by and by i know and i'm sure i'm right so the warnings were very gentle 
and the good people waited anxiously to hear more of hard study and less of splendid times daisy sometimes wondered with a pang of her faithful heart if one of the charming minas hildegards and lotchins mentioned were not stealing her gnat away from her but she never asked always wrote calmly and cheerfully and looked in vain for any hint of change in the letters that were worn out with much reading month after month slipped away till the holidays came with gifts good wishes and brilliant festivities nat expected to enjoy himself very much and did at first for a german christmas is a spectacle worth seeing but he paid dearly for the abandon with which he threw himself into the gaieties of that memorable week and on new year's day the reckoning came it seemed as if some malicious fairy had prepared the surprises that arrived so unwelcome were they so magical the change they wrought turning his happy world into a scene of desolation and despair as suddenly as a transformation at the pantomime the first came in the morning when duly armed with costly bouquets and bonbons he went to thank mina and her mother for the braces embroidered with forget-me-nots and the silk socks knit by the old lady's nimble fingers which he had found upon his table that day the frau mamma received him graciously but when he asked for the daughter the good lady frankly demanded what his intentions were adding that certain gossip which had reached her ear made it necessary for him to declare himself or come no more as minna's peace must not be compromised a more panic-stricken youth was seldom seen than nat as he received this unexpected demand he saw too late that his american style of gallantry had deceived the artless girl and might be used with terrible effect by the artful mother if she chose to do it nothing but the truth could save him and he had the honor and honesty to tell it faithfully a sad scene followed for nat was obliged to strip off his fictitious splendor confess himself only a poor student and humbly ask pardon for the thoughtless freedom with which he had enjoyed their too confiding hospitality if he had any doubts of frau schomberg's motives and desires they were speedily set at rest by the frankness with which she showed her disappointment the vigor with which she scolded him and the scorn with which she cast him off when her splendid castles in the air collapsed the sincerity of nat's penitence softened her a little and she consented to a farewell word with mina who had listened at the keyhole and was produced drenched in tears to fall on nat's bosom crying oh the dear one never can i forget thee though so my heart is broken this was worse than the scolding for the stout lady also wept and it was only after much german gush and twaddle that he escaped feeling like another werther while the deserted lottie consoled herself with the bonbons her mother with the more valuable gifts the second surprise arrived as he dined with professor baumgarten his appetite had been effectually taken away by the scene of the morning and his spirits received another damper when a fellow-student cheerfully informed him that he was about to go to america and should make it his agreeable duty to call on the lieber herr professor bear to tell him how gaily his protege was disporting himself at leipzig nat's heart died within him as he imagined the effect these glowing tales would have at plumfield not that he had wilfully deceived them but in his letters many things were left untold and when carlson added with a friendly wink that he would merely hint at the coming betrothal of the fair mina and his heart's friend nat found himself devoutly hoping that this other inconvenient heart's friend might go to the bottom of the sea before he reached plumfield to blast all his hopes by these tales of a misspent winter 
collecting his wits he cautioned carlson with what he flattered himself was mephistophelian art and gave him such confused directions that it would be a miracle if he ever found professor bear but the dinner was spoilt for nat and he got away as soon as possible to wander disconsolately about the streets with no heart for the theatre or the supper he was to share with some gay comrades afterwards he comforted himself a little by giving alms to sundry beggars making two children happy with gilded gingerbread and drinking a lonely glass of beer in which he toasted his daisy and wished himself a better year than the last had been going home at length he found a third surprise awaiting him in the shower of bills which had descended upon him like a snowstorm burying him in an avalanche of remorse despair and self-disgust these bills were so many and so large that he was startled and dismayed for as mr bear wisely predicted he knew little about the value of money it would take every dollar at the bankers to pay them all at once and leave him penniless for the next six months unless he wrote home for more he would rather starve than do that and his first impulse was to seek help at the gaming table whither his new friends had often tempted him but he had promised mr bear to resist what then had seemed an impossible temptation and now he would not add another fault to the list already so long borrow he would not nor beg what could he do for these appalling bills must be paid and the lessons go on or his journey was an ignominious failure but he must live meantime and how bowed down with remorse for the folly of these months he saw too late whither he was drifting and for hours paced up and down his pretty rooms floundering in a slow of despond with no helping hand to pull him out at least he thought so till letters were brought in and among fresh bills lay one well-worn envelope with an american stamp in the corner ah how welcome it was how eagerly he read the long pages full of affectionate wishes from all at home for every one had sent a line and as each familiar name appeared his eyes grew dimmer and dimmer till as he read the last god bless my boy mother bear he broke down and laying his head on his arms blistered the paper with a rain of tears that eased his heart and washed away the boyish sins that now lay so heavy on his conscience dear people how they love and trust me and how bitterly they would be disappointed if they knew what a fool i've been i'll fiddle in the streets again before i'll ask for help from them cried nat brushing away the tears of which he was ashamed although he felt the good they had done now he seemed to see more clearly what to do for the helping hand had been stretched across the sea and love the dear evangelist had lifted him out of the slow and shown him the narrow gate beyond which deliverance lay when the letter had been re-read and one corner where a daisy was painted passionately kissed nat felt strong enough to face the worst and conquer it every bill should be paid every saleable thing of his own sold these costly rooms given up and once back with thrifty frau tetzel he would find work of some sort by which to support himself as many another student did he must give up the new friends turn his back on the gay life cease to be a butterfly and take his place among the grubs it was the only honest thing to do but very hard for the poor fellow to crush his little vanities renounce the delights so dear to the young own his folly and step down from his pedestal to be pitied laughed at and forgotten it took all nat's pride and courage to do this for his was a sensitive nature esteem was very precious to him failure very bitter and nothing but the inborn contempt for meanness and deceit kept him from asking help or trying to hide his need by some dishonest device 
as he sat alone that night mr bear's words came back to him with curious clearness and he saw himself a boy again at plumfield punishing his teacher as a lesson to himself when timidity had made him lie you shall not suffer for me again and i won't be a sneak if i'm a fool i'll go and tell professor baumgarten all about it and ask his advice i'd rather face a loaded cannon but it must be done then i'll sell out pay my debt and go back where i belong better to be an honest pauper than a jackdaw among peacocks and nat smiled in the midst of his trouble as he looked about him at the little elegancies of his room remembering what he came from he kept his word manfully and was much comforted to find that his experience was an old story to the professor who approved his plan thinking wisely that the discipline would be good for him and was very kind in offering help and promising to keep the secret of his folly from his friend bear till nat had redeemed himself the first week of the new year was spent by our prodigal in carrying out his plan with penitent dispatch and his birthday found him alone in the little room high up at frau tetzel's with nothing of his former splendor but sundry unsaleable keepsakes from the buxom maidens who mourned his absence deeply his male friends had ridiculed pitied and soon left him alone with one or two exceptions who offered their purses generously and promised to stand by him he was lonely and heavy-hearted and sat brooding over his small fire as he remembered the last new year's day at plumfield when at this hour he was dancing with his daisy a tap at the door roused him and with a careless herein he waited to see who had climbed so far for his sake it was the good frau proudly bearing a tray on which stood a bottle of wine and an astonishing cake bedecked with sugar-plums of every hue and crowned with candles fraulein vogelstein followed embracing a blooming rose-tree above which her gray curls waved and her friendly face beamed joyfully as she cried dear herr black we bring you greetings and a little gift or two in honor of this ever to be remembered day best wishes and may the new year bloom for you as beautifully as we your hard warm friends desire yes yes in truth we do dear herr added frau tetzel eat of this with joy made kuchen and drink to the health of the faraway beloved ones in the good wine amused yet touched by the kindness of the good souls nat thanked them both and made them stay to enjoy the humble feast with him this they gladly did being motherly women full of pity for the dear youth whose straits they knew and having substantial help to offer as well as kind words and creature comforts frau tetzel with some hesitation mentioned a friend of hers who forced by illness to leave his place in the orchestra of a second-rate theatre would gladly offer it to nat if he could accept so humble a position blushing and toying with the roses like a shy girl good old vogelstein asked if in his leisure moments he could give english lessons in the young lady's school where she taught painting adding that a small but certain salary would be paid him gratefully nat accepted both offers finding it less humiliating to be helped by women than by friends of his own sex this work would support him in a frugal way and certain musical drudgery promised by his master assured his own teaching delighted with the success of their little plot these friendly neighbors left him with cheery words warm hand grasps and faces beaming with feminine satisfaction at the hearty kiss nat put on each faded cheek as the only return he could make for all their helpful kindness it was strange how much brighter the world looked after that for hope was a better cordial than the wine and good resolutions bloomed as freshly as the little rose-tree that filled the room with fragrance as nat woke the echoes with the dear old airs 
finding now as always his best comforter in music to whom henceforth he swore to be a more loyal subject End of chapter 13、Chapter、14。Plays at Plumfield. As it is as impossible for the humble historian of the March family to write a story without theatricals in it as for our dear Miss Young to get on with less than twelve or fourteen children in her interesting tales, we will accept the fact and at once cheer ourselves after the last afflicting events by proceeding to the Christmas plays at Plumfield. For they influence the fate of several of our characters and cannot well be skipped. When the college was built, Mr. Lorry added a charming little t h e a t r e which not only served for plays, but declamations, lectures, and concerts. The drop curtain displayed Apollo with the muses grouped about him. And as a compliment to the donor of the hall, the artist had given the god a decided resemblance to our friend, which was considered a superb joke by every one else. Home talent furnished stars, stock company, orchestra, and scene painter, and astonishing performances were given on this pretty little stage. Mrs. Joe had been trying for some time to produce a play which should be an improvement upon the adaptations from the French then in vogue, curious mixtures of fine toilettes, false sentiment, and feeble wit, with no touch of nature to redeem them. It was easy to plan plays full of noble speeches and thrilling situations, but very hard to write them. So she contented herself with a few scenes of humble life in which the comic and pathetic were mingled, and as she fitted her characters to her actors, she hoped the little venture would prove that truth and simplicity had not entirely lost their power to charm. Mr. Lorry helped her, and they called themselves Beaumont and Fletcher, enjoying their joint labor very much. For Beaumont's knowledge of dramatic art was of great use in curbing Fletcher's too aspiring pen, and they flattered themselves that they had produced a neat and effective bit of work as an experiment. All was ready now, and Christmas Day was much enlivened by last rehearsals, the panics of timid actors, the scramble for forgotten properties, and the decoration of the theater. Evergreen and holly from the woods, blooming plants from the hothouse on Parnassus, and flags of all nations made it very gay that night in honor of the guests who were coming, chief among them Miss Cameron, who kept her promise faithfully. The orchestra tuned their instruments with unusual care. The scene shifter set their stage with lavish elegance. The prompter heroically took his seat in the stifling nook provided for him, and the actors dressed with trembling hands that dropped the pins, and perspiring brows whereon the powder wouldn't stick. Beaumont and Fletcher were everywhere, feeling that their literary reputation was at stake. For sundry friendly critics were invited, and reporters, like mosquitoes, cannot be excluded from any earthly scene, be it a great man's deathbed or a dime museum. Has she come? was the question asked by every tongue behind the curtain, and when Tom, who played an old man, endangered his respectable legs among the footlights to peep, announced that he saw Miss Cameron's handsome head in the place of honor. A thrill pervaded the entire company, and Josie declared with an excited gasp that she was going to have stage fright for the first time in her life. I'll shake you if you do, said Mrs. Joe. Who was in such a wild state of dishevelment with her varied labours that she might have gone on as Madge Wildlife without an additional rag or crazy elf lock? You'll have time to get your wits together while we do our piece. We are old stagers, 
and calm as clocks. Answered Demi, with a nod towards Alice, ready in her pretty dress and all her properties at hand. But both clocks were going rather faster than usual, as heightened color, brilliant eyes, and a certain flutter under the laces and velvet coat betrayed. They were to open the entertainment with a gay little piece, which they had played before and did remarkably well. Alice was a tall girl, with dark hair and eyes, and a face which intelligence, health, and a happy heart made beautiful. She was looking her best now, for the brocades, plumes, and powder of the Marquise became her stately figure, and Demi, in his court suit, with sword, three-cornered hat, and white wig, made as gallant a baron as one would wish to see. Josie was the maid, and looked her part to the life, being as pretty, pert, and inquisitive as any French sobray. These three were all the characters, and the success of the piece depended on the spirit and skill with which the quickly changing moods of the quarrelsome lovers were given, their witty speeches made to tell, and by-play suited to the courtly period in which the scene was laid. Few would have recognized sober John and studious Alice in the dashing gentleman and coquettish lady who kept the audience laughing at their caprices, while they enjoyed the brilliant costumes and admired the ease and grace of the young actors. Josie was a prominent figure in the plot, as she listened at keyholes, peeped into notes, and popped in and out at all the most inopportune moments, with her nose in the air, her hands in her apron pockets, and curiosity pervading her little figure, from the topmost bow of her jaunty cap to the red heels of her slippers. All went smoothly, and the capricious Marquis, after tormenting the devoted baron to her heart's content, owned herself conquered in the war of wits, and was just offering the hand he had fairly won when a crash startled them, and a heavily decorated side scene swayed forward, ready to fall upon Alice. Demi saw it and sprung before her to catch and hold it up, standing like a modern Samson with the wall of a house on his back. The danger was over in a moment, and he was about to utter his last speech when the excited young scene-shifter, who had flown up a ladder to repair the damage, leaned over to whisper, All right, and released Demi from his spread-eagle attitude. As he did so, a hammer slipped out of his pocket to fall upon the upturned face below, inflicting a smart blow and literally knocking the baron's part out of his head. A quick curtain robbed the audience of a pretty little scene not down on the bill, for the marquise flew to staunch the blood with a cry of alarm. Oh, John, you are hurt. Lean on me which John gladly did for a moment, being a trifle dazed, yet quite able to enjoy the tender touch of the hands busied about him and the anxiety of the face so near his own, for both told him something which he would have considered cheaply won by a rain of hammers and the fall of the whole college on his head. Nan was on the spot in a moment with the case that never left her pocket, and the wound was neatly plastered up by the time Mrs. Joe arrived, demanding, tragically, Is he too much hurt to go on again? If he is, my play is lost. I'm all the fitter for it, Auntie, for here's a real instead of a painted wound. I'll be ready. Don't worry about me. And catching up his wig, Demi was off, with only a very eloquent look of thanks to the Marquise, who had spoiled her gloves for his sake, but did not seem to mind it at all, though they reached above her elbows and were most expensive. "'How are your nerves, Fletcher?' asked Mr. Lorry, as they stood together during the breathless minute before the last bell rings. "'About as calm as yours, Beaumont.' answered Mrs. Joe, gesticulating wildly to Mrs. Meg to set her cap straight. Bear up, partner. I'll stand by you whatever comes. I feel that it ought to go, for, though it's a mere trifle, a good deal of honest work and truth have gone into it. Doesn't Meg look the picture of our dear old countrywoman? 
she certainly did as she sat in the farmhouse kitchen by a cheery fire rocking a cradle and darning stockings as if she had done nothing else all her life gray hair skillfully drawn lines on the forehead and a plain gown with cap little shawl and check apron changed her into a comfortable motherly creature who found favor the moment the curtain went up and discovered her rocking darning and crooning an old song in a short soliloquy about sam her boy who wanted to enlist dolly her discontented little daughter who longed for city ease and pleasures and poor elize who had married badly and came home to die bequeathing her baby to her mother lest its bad father should claim it the little story was very simply opened and made effective by the real boiling of the kettle on the crane the ticking of a tall clock and the appearance of a pair of blue worsted shoes which waved fitfully in the air to the soft babble of a baby's voice those shapeless little shoes won the first applause and mr lorry forgetting elegance in satisfaction whispered to his coadjutor i thought the baby would fetch them if the dear thing won't squall in the wrong place we are saved but it's risky be ready to catch it if all meg's cuddlings prove in vain answered mrs joe adding with a clutch at mr lorry's arm as a haggard face appeared at the window here's demi i hope no one will recognize him when he comes on as the sun i'll never forgive you for not doing the villain yourself can't run the thing and act too he's capitally made up and likes a bit of melodrama this scene ought to have come later but i wanted to show that the mother was the heroine as soon as possible i'm tired of love-sick girls and runaway wives we'll prove that there's romance in old women also now he's coming and in slouched a degraded-looking man shabby unshaven and evil-eyed trying to assume a masterful air as he dismayed the tranquil old woman by demanding his child a powerful scene followed and mrs meg surprised even those who knew her best by the homely dignity with which she at first met the man she dreaded then as he brutally pressed his claim she pleaded with trembling voice and hands to keep the little creature she had promised the dying mother to protect and when he turned to take it by force quite a thrill went through the house as the old woman sprung to snatch it from the cradle and holding it close defied him in god's name to tear it from that sacred refuge it was really well done and the round of applause that greeted the fine tableau of the indignant old woman the rosy blinking baby clinging to her neck and the daunted man who dared not execute his evil purpose with such a defender for helpless innocence told the excited authors that their first scene was a hit the second was quieter and introduced josie as a bonny country lass setting the supper-table in a bad humor the pettish way in which she slapped down the plates hustled the cups and cut the big brown loaf as she related her girlish trials and ambitions was capital mrs joe kept her eye on miss cameron and saw her nod approval several times at some natural tone or gesture some good bit of by-play or a quick change of expression in the young face which was as variable as an april day her struggle with the toasting fork made much merriment so did her contempt for the brown sugar and the relish with which she sweetened her irksome duties by eating it and when she sat like cinderella on the hearth tearfully watching the flames dance on the homely room a girlish voice was heard to exclaim impulsively poor little thing she ought to have some fun the old woman enters and mother and daughter have a pretty scene in which the latter coaxes and threatens kisses and cries till she wins the reluctant consent of the former to visit a rich relation in the city and from being a little thundercloud dolly becomes bewitchingly gay and good as soon as her wilful wish is granted the poor old soul has hardly recovered from this trial when the son enters in army blue tells he has enlisted and must go that is a hard blow but the patriotic mother bears it well 
and not till the thoughtless young folks have hastened away to tell their good news elsewhere does she break down then the country kitchen becomes pathetic as the old mother sits alone mourning over her children till the gray head is hidden in the hands as she kneels down by the cradle to weep and pray with only baby to comfort her fond and faithful heart sniffs were audible all through the latter part of this scene and when the curtain fell people were so busy wiping their eyes that for a moment they forgot to applaud that silent moment was more flattering than noise and as mrs joe wiped the real tears off her sister's face she said as solemnly as an unconscious dab of rouge on her nose permitted meg you have saved my play oh why aren't you a real actress and i a real playwright don't gush now dear but help me dress josie she's in such a quiver of excitement i can't manage her and this is her best scene you know so it was for her aunt had written it especially for her and little joe was happy in a gorgeous dress with a train long enough to satisfy her wildest dreams the rich relations parlor was in festival array and the country cousin sails in looking back at her sweeping flounces with such artless rapture that no one had the heart to laugh at the pretty jay in borrowed plumes she has confidence with herself in the mirror from which it is made evident that she had discovered all is not gold that glitters and has found greater temptations than those a girlish love of pleasure luxury and flattery bring her she is sought by a rich lover but her honest heart resists the allurements he offers and in its innocent perplexity wishes mother was there to comfort and counsel a gay little dance in which dora nan bess and several of the boys took part made a good background for the humble figure of the old woman in her widow's bonnet rusty shawl big umbrella and basket her naive astonishment as she surveys the spectacle feels the curtains and smooths her old gloves during the moment she remains unseen was very good but josie's unaffected start when she sees her and the cry why there's mother was such a hearty little bit of nature it hardly needed the impatient tripping over her train as she ran into the arms that seemed now to be her nearest refuge the lover plays his part and ripples of merriment greeted the old woman's searching questions and blunt answers during the interview which shows the girl how shallow his love is and how near she had been to ruining her life as bitterly as poor eliza did she gives her answer frankly and when they are alone looks from her own bedizened self to the shabby dress work-worn hands and tender face crying with a repentant sob and kiss take me home mother and keep me safe i've had enough of this that will do you good maria don't forget it said one lady to her daughter as the curtain went down and the girl answered well i'm sure i don't see why it's touching but it is as she spread her lace handkerchief to dry tom and nan came out strong in the next scene for it was a ward in an army hospital and surgeon and nurse went from bed to bed feeling pulses administering doses and hearing complaints with an energy and gravity which convulsed the audience the tragic element never far from the comic at such times and places came in when while they bandaged an arm the doctor told the nurse about an old woman who was searching through the hospital for her son after days and nights on battlefields through ambulances and among scenes which would have killed most women she will be here directly and i dread her coming for i'm afraid the poor lad who has just gone is her boy i'd rather face a cannon than these brave women with their hope and courage and great sorrow says the surgeon ah uh, these poor mothers break my heart adds the nurse wiping her eyes on her big apron and with the words mrs meg came in 
there was the same dress the basket and umbrella the rustic speech the simple manners but all were made pathetic by the terrible experience which had changed the tranquil old woman to that haggard figure with wild eyes dusty feet trembling hands and an expression of mingled anguish resolution and despair which gave the homely figure a tragic dignity and power that touched all hearts a few broken words told the story of her vain search and then the sad quest began again people held their breath as led by the nurse she went from bed to bed showing in her face the alternations of hope dread and bitter disappointment as each was passed on a narrow cot was a long figure covered with a sheet and here she paused to lay one hand on her heart and one on her eyes as if to gather courage to look at the nameless dead then she drew down the sheet gave a long shivering sigh of relief saying softly not my son thank god but some other mother's boy and stooping down she kissed the cold forehead tenderly somebody sobbed there and miss cameron shook two tears out of her eyes anxious to lose no look or gesture as the poor soul nearly spent with the long strain struggled on down the long line but her search was happily ended for as if her voice had roused him from his feverish sleep a gaunt wild-eyed man sat up in his bed and stretching his arms to her cried in a voice that echoed through the room mother mother i knew you'd come to me she did go to him with a cry of love and joy that thrilled every listener as she gathered him in her arms with the tears and prayers and blessings such as only a fond and faithful old mother could give the last scene was a cheerful contrast to this for the country kitchen was bright with christmas cheer the wounded hero with black patch and crutches well displayed sat by the fire in the old chair whose familiar creak was soothing to his ear pretty dolly was stirring about gaily trimming dresser settle high chimney-piece and old-fashioned cradle with mistletoe and holly while the mother rested beside her son with that blessed baby on her knee refreshed by a nap and nourishment this young actor now covered himself with glory by his ecstatic prancings incoherent remarks to the audience and vain attempts to get to the footlights as he blinked approvingly at these brilliant toys it was good to see mrs meg pat him on the back cuddle the fat legs out of sight and appease his vain longings with a lump of sugar till baby embraced her with a grateful ardor that brought him a round of applause all for his little self a sound of singing outside disturbs the happy family and after a carol in the snowy moonlight a flock of neighbors troop in with christmas gifts and greetings much by-play made this a lively picture for sam's sweetheart hovered round him with a tenderness the marquise did not show the baron and dolly had a pretty bit under the mistletoe with her rustic adorer who looked so like ham peggotty in his cowhide boots rough jacket and dark beard and wig that no one would have recognized ted but for the long legs which no extent of leather could disguise it ended with a homely feast brought by the guests and as they sat round the table covered with doughnuts and cheese pumpkin pie and other delicacies sam rises on his crutches to propose the first toast and holding up his mug of cider says with a salute and a choke in his voice mother god bless her all drink it standing dolly with her arm round the old woman's neck as she hides her happy tears on her daughter's breast while the irrepressible baby beat rapturously on the table with a spoon and crowed audibly as the curtain went down they had it up again in a jiffy to get a last look at the group about that central figure which was showered with bouquets to the great delight of the infant roscius till a fat rosebud hit him on the nose and produced the much dreaded squall which 
fortunately only added to the fun at that moment well that will do for a beginning said beaumont with a sigh of relief as the curtain descended for the last time and the actors scattered to dress for the closing piece as an experiment it is a success now we can venture to begin our great american drama answered mrs joe full of satisfaction and grand ideas for the famous play which we may add she did not write that year owing to various dramatic events in her own family the owl's dark marbles closed the entertainment and being something new proved amusing to this very indulgent audience the gods and goddesses on parnassus were displayed in full conclave and thanks to mrs amy's skill in draping and posing the white wigs and cotton flannel robes were classically correct and graceful though sundry modern additions somewhat marred the effect while adding point to the showman's learned remarks mr lorry was professor owl's dark in cap and gown and after a high-flown introduction he proceeded to exhibit and explain his marbles the first figure was a stately minerva but a second glance produced a laugh for the words women's rights adorned her shield a scroll bearing the motto vote early and often hung from the beak of the owl perched on her lance and a tiny pestle and mortar ornamented her helmet attention was drawn to the firm mouth the piercing eye the awe-inspiring brow of the strong-minded woman of antiquity and some scathing remarks made upon the degeneracy of her modern sisters who failed to do their duty mercury came next and was very fine in his airy attitude though the winged legs quivered as if it was difficult to keep the lively god in his place his restless nature was dilated upon his mischievous freaks alluded to and a very bad character given to the immortal messenger boy which delighted his friends and caused the marble nose of the victim to curl visibly with scorn when derisive applause greeted a particularly hard hit a charming little hebe stood next pouring nectar from a silver teapot into a blue china teacup she also pointed a moral for the professor explained that the nectar of old was the beverage which cheers but does not inebriate and regretted that the excessive devotion of american women to this classic brew proved so harmful owing to the great development of brain their culture produced a touch at modern servants in contrast to this accomplished table girl made the statue's cheeks glow under the chalk and brought her a hearty round as the audience recognized dolly and the smart soubrette jove in all his majesty followed as he and his wife occupied the central pedestals in the half circle of immortals a splendid jupiter with hair well set up off the fine brow ambrosial beard silver thunderbolts in one hand and a well-worn ferule in the other a large stuffed eagle from the museum stood at his feet and the benign expression of his august countenance showed that he was in a good humour as well he might be for he was paid some handsome compliments upon his wise rule the peaceful state of his kingdom and the brood of all accomplished palaces that yearly issued from his mighty brain cheers greeted this and other pleasant words and caused the thunderer to bow his thanks for jove nods as every one knows and flattery wins the hearts of gods and men mrs juno with her peacock's darning needle pen and cooking spoon did not get off so easily for the professor was down on her with all manner of mirth-provoking accusations criticisms and insults even he alluded to her domestic infelicity her meddlesome disposition sharp tongue bad temper and jealousy closing however with a tribute to her skill in caring for the wounds and settling the quarrels of belligerent heroes as well as her love for youths in olympus and on earth 
gales of laughter greeted these hits varied by hisses from some indignant boys who would not bear even in joke any disrespect to dear mother bear who however enjoyed it all immensely as the twinkle in her eye and the irrepressible pucker of her lips betrayed a jolly bacchus astride of his cask took vulcan's place and appeared to be very comfortable with a beer mug in one hand a champagne bottle in the other and a garland of grapes on his curly head he was the text of a short temperance lecture aimed directly at a row of smart young gentlemen who lined the walls of the auditorium george cole was seen to dodge behind a pillar at one point dolly nudged his neighbor at another and there was laughter all along the line as the professor glared at them through his big glasses and dragged their bacchanalian orgies to the light and held them up to scorn seeing the execution he had done the learned man turned to the lovely diana who stood as white and still as the plaster stag beside her with sandals bow and crescent quite perfect and altogether the best piece of statuary in the show she was very tenderly treated by the paternal critic who merely alluding to her confirmed spinsterhood fondness for athletic sports and oracular powers gave a graceful little exposition of true art and passed on to the last figure this was apollo in full fig his curls skilfully arranged to hide a well-whitened patch over the eye his handsome legs correctly poised and his gifted fingers about to draw divine music from the silvered gridiron which was his lyre his divine attributes were described as well as his little follies and failings among which were his weakness for photography and flute-playing his attempts to run a newspaper and his fondness for the society of the muses which latter slap produced giggles and blushes among the girl graduates and much mirth among the stricken youths for misery loves company and after this they began to rally then with a ridiculous conclusion the professor bowed his thanks and after several recalls the curtain fell but not quickly enough to conceal mercury wildly waving his liberated legs hebe dropping her teapot bacchus taking a lovely roll on his barrel and mrs juno rapping the impertinent owl's dark on the head with jove's ruler while the audience filed out to supper in the hall the stage was a scene of dire confusion as gods and goddesses farmers and barons maids and carpenters congratulated one another on the success of their labors assuming various costumes actors and actresses soon joined their guests to sip bounteous draughts of praise with their coffee and cool their modest blushes with ice cream mrs meg was a proud and happy woman when miss cameron came to her as she sat by josie with demi serving both and said so cordially that it was impossible to doubt the sincerity of her welcome words mrs brick i no longer wonder where your children get their talent i make my compliments to the baron and next summer you must let me have little dolly as a pupil when we are at the beach one can easily imagine how this offer was received as well as the friendly commendation bestowed by the same kind critic on the work of beaumont and fletcher who hastened to explain that this trifle was only an attempt to make nature and art go hand in hand with little help from fine writing or imposing scenery everybody was in the happiest mood especially little dolly who danced like a will-o'-the-wisp with light-footed mercury and apollo as he promenaded with the marquise on his arm who seemed to have left her coquetry in the green room with her rouge when all was over mrs juno said to jove to whose arm she clung as they trudged home along the snowy paths fritz dear christmas is a good time for new resolutions and i've made one never to be impatient or fretful with my beloved husband again i know i am though you won't own it but laurie's fun had some truth in it and i felt hit in a tender spot henceforth i am a model wife 
else I don't deserve the dearest, best man ever born. And, being in a dramatic mood, Mrs. Juno tenderly embraced her excellent Jove in the moonlight, to the great amusement of sundry lingerers behind them. So all three plays might be considered successes, and that merry Christmas night a memorable one in the March family. For Demi got an unspoken question answered, Josie's fondest wish was granted, and, thanks to Professor Owlstark's jest, Mrs. Joe made Professor Bear's busy life quite a bed of roses by the keeping of her resolution. A few days later she had her reward for this burst of virtue in Dan's letter, which set her fears at rest and made her very happy, though she was unable to tell him so, because he sent her no address. End of chapter 14